This is WCNY's The Capitol Press Room, and we're highlighting legislation that would require a healthcare provider to receive informed consent before conducting a screening for alcohol or drugs in pregnant or postpartum women and their newborns. To make the case for this legislation, which was scheduled for an assembly vote this spring before ultimately being pulled from debate, we're joined by Jenna Lauder, a policy counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union. Welcome to the show, Jenna. Thanks for having me. And we're also going to hear from Desiree Wright, a family defense practice policy advocate at the Bronx Defenders. Thanks for making the time, Desiree. Thanks for having me here. So for starters, how and when are involuntary screenings for drug and alcohol being conducted uh, on pregnant or, or postpartum women uh, in the healthcare setting? So across New York State, we understand that pregnant people and their newborns are frequently being drug tested when they present to give birth without their knowledge, let alone their consent. And often the first time a person finds out that they've even been drug tested is when a caseworker from the family regulation system, that's the language that we use to describe what is traditionally known as the child welfare system. The first time a person often finds out that they've been drug tested is when a family regulation system caseworker appears at their bedside in the hospital to interrogate them and begin an investigation into their family. Um, people are also often reported into this family regulation system after after having verbal drug screens performed on them by their healthcare provider. And then the answers from those screens can also then serve as the basis for a report triggering this family regulation system involvement. We understand that it is you know, disproportionately Black and Brown pregnant people who are subjected to this practice, despite similar rates of substance use in Black and white communities. And this is a really a problem that affects people across New York State with people coming forward to share their experiences, both from New York City and as far as, you know, Buffalo. So you outlined some of the potential outcomes of the drug testing. Is it also possible that the testing could help uh, a new mother and their child access health services that they might not otherwise have gotten? So this is really a misconception that I okay. think um, people people often have, which is that a report to the family regulation system is necessary to connect people with substance use treatment and support. And unfortunately, um, this is just simply not the case. What this reporting does is it funnels people into a system that is highly punitive and where they're then subjected to an investigation and potentially even a family separation from their newborn, which is you know, the opposite of what we need to be doing to support people who are parenting and perhaps struggling with a substance use issue. The best course of treatment for a newborn who is has been exposed to substances in utero is eat, sleep, and console. It's, it's time with their parent. And what these reports do is it takes that source of support away from, from the child and from the parents. These tests are largely ineffective at connecting people with care even outside of the family regulation system. The best thing that providers can do with their patients is foster a trusting, open, collaborative relationship where the pregnant person feels comfortable speaking to their provider about whatever, whatever challenges they're facing um, and so that they can be connected with supports that are useful to them and that they are ready to receive. So while the child welfare system may not be the way to connect a mother or their child with the necessary health services that they might need, I have to imagine that the testing itself, though, could indicate whether that person needs those services. So is it still important to have a person who may have consumed drug or alcohol be tested in some capacity? A provider who has concerns about potential substance use should offer their patient those resources regardless and encourage them to seek out resources that they might need. A drug test is not necessary to provide resources to patients. And, and moreover, 
If a provider does think that a drug test is medically necessary to inform the course of care for their patient, they should have that conversation with the patient and explain why they think it's necessary. And, and in that context of transparency, request the patient's consent to undergo that test. Um, testing a patient without their knowledge or consent makes it less likely that the patient will be receptive to any additional intervention. Is there reason to believe that getting informed consent would be a heavy burden? I have to imagine there are healthcare professionals who just roll their eyes about uh, having to take these steps, but it seems like this is indicative of a larger problem we have in our healthcare system, which is a lack of a dialogue between patients and their healthcare providers, especially when it comes to people of color. Absolutely. I mean, informed consent is a fundamental tenet of medical care. So uh, providers are, are used to obtaining informed consent from patients in all kinds of circumstances, including in circumstances that are time sensitive. Providers can quickly have a conversation, share the risks, the benefits, why they're recommending some course of care, um, and, and get the patient's informed consent in order to proceed. Um, so there's really, you know, little reason, in my view, why providers would not be able to obtain informed consent when trying to perform a drug test or screen. I think it really does speak to sort of this intersection of um, stereotypes and really a lack of trust when it comes to drug use, particularly within communities of color, and also to pregnant people and pregnant people's right to maintain autonomy over their own bodies and to direct the course of their medical care. You know, this is an issue that really falls at that intersection of reproductive and racial justice, where the legacies of the war on drugs are um, you know, deeply ingrained within many people's psyches um, and, and shaping behavior. And not to mention that the parent is already probably embarrassed about their drug use, right? And so just having that care provider that you can trust and open up to about that usage would be more helpful than trying to hide it from the care provider because they don't trust them and they, they feel they're going to report them. So that trust is very important. And I, I, you'll probably hear me say that more in here, that the trust is so important with the health care provider and the patient. When providers are drug testing patients without their consent, it not only undermines the trust within that relationship, but it can deter those pregnant people and perinatal people and parents from seeking health care in the future. So to the extent that providers want to make sure that they're able to play a role in their patients' health care journeys, um, it's just essential that they're preserving, protecting, and nurturing that trusting relationship. Otherwise, they won't have any relationship with their patient. Well, does this bill spell out what informed consent should look like? Because I know I've been to healthcare providers and signed a whole bunch of forms, not necessarily knowing what I've just signed. But if I was to take the time, I would have a good understanding. If I asked questions, I could know what's going on. But maybe that's too high of a burden to account as informed consent under this proposal. No, I'm glad you asked. The bill would require both written and oral informed consent for precisely the reason that you named. We know that people show up at their doctor's office and receive a stack of consent forms and rarely do they actually read them. Um, not to mention people have different levels of language ability, speak different language languages. Um, and so it's really crucial that oral consent is part of the conversation. So people know what they're consenting to and are making that choice in an intentional way in the moment. So for drug tests, and verbal drug screens that are provided in a hospital setting, um, both oral and written consent uh, must be obtained. Outside of a hospital setting, oral and written consent must be obtained before performing a biologic drug test, and verbal consent alone is sufficient for a verbal drug screening conversation. Verbally saying it to them as well is so important because language barriers is so much, and then not even understanding what they're signing, right? So like just to verbally let them know is it's so much more comfortable to a person than just having them just sign documents. So why is this the right approach to this issue as opposed to either reforming 
who is a mandated reporter of abuse and neglect, or changing the threshold for when a healthcare reporter is required to report uh, what they suspect is abuse and neglect, maybe raising that threshold. Is that not a viable option to ensure that this is something that stays in the healthcare realm and not in the child welfare sector? So already under New York law, a positive drug test standing alone is not a sufficient basis to report someone to the family regulation system. And yet we know that these reports are still routinely being made. So um, clearly additional legislation is needed to make sure that providers are crystal clear on what the law does and doesn't require. And I think also to address some of the more upstream consequences of test and report. Yes, the reporting is deeply harmful and problematic, but the fact of the test itself is also a violation. Um, it really undermines pregnant people's bodily autonomy. Um, and we know that in this moment, it is more important than ever that New York State is taking every opportunity to affirm that pregnant people have the right to control what does and doesn't happen to their own bodies. And what about the idea that maybe this is a public health threat and as opposed to leaving it up to doctors to decide who's going to get screened, all pregnant women or postpartum women are screened uh, for the greater public health good. Would that resolve the disproportionate testing issue that you highlighted earlier and ensure that people are getting uh, health care that they might need and, and in those cases maybe where someone's not presenting with uh, an alcohol or drug problem? Unfortunately, we know that even if drug testing and screening is universal, um, the harshest impacts and outcomes of those tests and screens will fall on black and brown communities. Um, Black and brown pregnant people will be more likely to be reported to the family regulation system as opposed to met with dignity and compassion and support. And actually, the NYCLU recently published a report highlighting how in New York City specifically, um, when families are involved with uh, the family regulation system, uh, the racial disparities in that involvement actually grow as people move through the system. So um, not only will universal testing and screening be unlikely to effectively connect people with care, um, it is difficult to force someone into care, particularly if you are breaking their trust by conducting these tests. Um, but we also know that it is still likely to have these racially disproportionate and punitive impacts on black and brown communities. And I just wanna add that everybody should just have that right. It doesn't matter the community, everybody should have that right to consent to the, their body being tested without their, without their consent. Like everybody should have that right. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. We've been speaking with Desiree Wright. She's a family defense practice policy advocate at the Bronx Defenders. Desiree, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for having me. And we've also been talking with Jenna Louder, a policy counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union. Thank you so much, Jenna. Thanks for having me, David. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.